I, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Michelle O'Sullivan from the Kemi Business School in the University of Limerick to our union offices today uh, to talk about the research that you and your colleagues in UL have been doing on technology and work. So you're, you're very welcome and thank you for participating. No problem. Um, so you've been working with FSU since around 2019. Um, can you tell us about the project and what has it delivered so far? So myself and my colleagues in University of Limerick have been working, as you say, with the FSU since 2019, and we're delighted to come on board. And the FSU asks us to undertake research on the area of technology in financial services. So financial services sector has been identified internationally as one of the sectors which is experiencing the, some of the most significant change in terms of technology uh, in the workplace. And this was an area that the FSU wanted to concentrate on. So we did an initial study in 2019, looking at some key issues related to technology in the workplace. And there were some interesting results from that which needed kind of further investigation. Um, and one of those was that only 7% of uh, respondents at the time said that their employer had mechanisms in place in the workplace to prevent the overuse of technology. So obviously the area of the right to disconnect was a major concern arising out of that. And from the report then, the FSU built a campaign about seeking rights for workers on the right to disconnect. And the government introduced the code of practice on the right to disconnect following that. Um, but we've continued with the research because obviously technology is much broader than just the right to disconnect and we wanted to investigate issues further. And in particular, one of the key findings from that first report was that pretty equal numbers of respondents felt that there was positive and negative implications from technology in the workplace. And that's what we wanted to investigate again. OK, and so technology has obviously also facilitated um, more flexible forms of work. Mm -hmm. And I think we were seeing some remote working back in 2017 and 18 and 19, but obviously then with the pandemic, suddenly uh, remote working became far more prevalent for a hell of a lot more people in finance, tech and in the economy more generally. Um, what concerns does your most recent report that we're launching today um, tell us about uh, working remotely? What issues does it highlight that workers have uh, when they're working remotely? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, as you say, there was a huge shift to remote working during COVID. And when we conducted the survey in September, and October of 2021, there was a couple of key issues that arose from that in terms of concerns. Um, the first was in terms of uh, career issues. Um, so about 22% of respondents um, ex expressed the concern that their career opportunities uh, might be damaged as a result of remote working. And this would chime with research internationally, which suggests that career opportunities can be damaged by people's invisibility mm. uh, from working from home. And you also had a significant portion of people in that survey who weren't sure about the impact of remote working on their career uh, progression. So that's one major issue. The second one which came across quite prominently was the issue of the increased costs for workers of working from home. Um, so only 16% of respondents said that their employer had given them some sort of level of reimbursement for financial costs or contributed towards it. And a lot of the qualitative comments in the survey talked about the costs of the you know, internet, utilities um, arising from working from home. And people feel that the employers should be contributing to that because they are engaging in work. And so do you feel sure. employers are transferring those costs onto workers, onto employees? Yes. Costs that they would usually have. Yes, I mean, and, and the, you know, representative bodies in the banking sector have already mentioned this themselves explicitly. Uh, there was a review of banking done quite recently and it talked about the cost savings arising for uh, financial companies of people working from home, in particularly office costs. Um, so those costs have to go somewhere and they're being transferred onto workers. Okay. And any other concerns that flagged? So you've said, obviously, there can be potentially negative impacts on careers. There are costs associated with working from home. Any other issues and concerns from workers come out in this report? Uh, yeah, so the other major issue that arose from the survey was about workload. So 44% of respondents said that they felt drained by work, which is an incredibly high mm. uh, statistic. And when you look at other features of the survey, we might be able to piece together why that is. So almost a third of people said that they don't have enough time to get their work done. 
Um, and when you look at the qualitative comments in the survey and when you look at the interviews that we have done with workers in the financial services sector, you know, they talk about the massive change in uh, particularly in retail banks uh, and they talk about, you know, the restructuring, redundancies, uh, shortage of staffing, um, increased pressure in terms of sales and performance targets. So people are feeling under pressure from these changes in the banking environment and they've had to try to cope with those and, and they feel they don't have enough time. There's a lot of um, tight deadlines in terms of getting their work done. So we can see therefore that the work is encroaching on their private time as well and that's definitely an issue that needs uh, some attention. Okay, definitely one thing um, that comes out from the report is I think it's over 80% want some form of flexible working, working mm. from home. But the most popular form is a mix of working from home some days and working in the office a couple mm. of days. It's not fully working from home 100% of the time. Why do you think people in particular want a kind of a blended approach? Yes, you're, you're right. I mean, about 60% of people said that they wanted some form of hybrid remote working in the future, at least a few days a week. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, we've already mentioned the idea that people are concerned or are unsure about the impact of remote working on their career ambitions. So that might be one of the issues as to why people feel the need to come in to work, apart from being required to perhaps by their employer, is that they want some visibility in the workplace. There was also some comments as well in terms of uh, uh, from respondents in the survey talking about you know that there is um, a well-being element some people mentioned the idea that it can be lonely uh, to be remote working all the time I think what's important though is that when we look at hybrid working or any return to the office is that there were a lot of respondents talked about the the conditions that they face when they're in the office so that you know they come in to you know develop friendships and social contacts in the office but they might not necessarily be getting it so you know the way the office is structured, you know, the idea of hot desks was not very popular in respondent surveys. So while people might want some level of office working, it's important to be able to think about what type of office working that people have and to ensure that it, they are getting value out of it. Mm. Um, two, two comments when I read through the report, um, two comments that stood out to me um, were, were on that issue of, of costs and employees bearing the costs. And one was that costs are not being uh, reimbursed is a penalty um, for working from home, so there's a negative associated with it. And another participant said employers are making huge cost savings from this migration of work. Um, so clearly workers are concerned about that issue of cost being transferred. Um, what approaches have other countries um, taken to working from home costs um, that, that you're aware of? Quite a few countries in Europe um, are looking or have introduced legislation uh, related to remote working and flexible working. Uh, and uh, a number of those, for example, uh, Belgium, France, Spain, Luxembourg, have provided for the idea that employers should be looking to support financially workers in terms of the cost of remoting or remote working. So uh, the Belgian legislation specifically mentions, you know, that employers should reimburse people for internet and communication costs. Uh, the Spanish legislation talks about people being reimbursed for their expenses of working uh, from home and they mention utility costs. And the French legislation talks about how employers have to consider the idea uh, and uh, discuss the idea of costs when they're developing collective agreements or policies on remote working. I think what's important here to note as well is that, you know, as we've seen, there's other issues that need to be taken into account as well as, as costs. So I think, well, certainly cost then is, is one thing that this union will have to take forward on behalf of members in both engaging with government but also engaging with employers that there is some form of compensation, home working allowance or reimbursement, as you say, for those utility bills. I think that's something we'll, we'll need to address. Um, the government strategy has, has, has been fairly clear in wishing to, remit, to, to make remote working a permanent feature of employment. Um, what does the report and your findings indicate that a, that, that a government specifically needs to do if it is to make permanent remote working permanent decent remote working? What does the government need to look at? The government has produced a remote working bill and it's focused on the area of giving people a right to request remote working. 
Uh, now, there's been a lot of commentary on that and a lot of discussion about the fact that that's quite narrow. It doesn't give, a, give people a right to remote work. Uh, and there's a lot of people in the FSU survey which indicate that they would like the opportunity to remote work where they currently don't have it. So that's one element. There's other elements as well, though. I mean, the, the legislation that's currently proposed doesn't take into account a lot of the concerns uh, that arise from this research. For example, uh, like the career opportunities issues, uh, for example, like the workload issues. And the issue of costs is not totally clear either in the proposed legislation. So the issues around remote working are wider than just the idea of asking uh, can people uh, engage in remote working. And what if a group of workers want to negotiate with their employer a new remote working policy but their employer is refusing to recognise their trade union? How are those workers going to actually get a decent policy um, if there's no recognition law? It, without a union recognition law, it's extremely difficult for workers. Your workers are basically dependent on the discretion and goodwill of the employer. Uh, so for people who are non-unionised, they're going to find it quite difficult to be able to engage in a formal manner and in a manner in which they have some independent representation and advice on what, would, uh, what a, a good remote working policy should look like. Uh, the issue of influences is, is important because uh, on in the survey we see that respondents feel that they don't have enough influence over issues like where their job should be located. Uh, so the government does need to introduce legislation which does give unions access to workers and representation rights for those workers. And you know the European institutions have recognised that this is a mutual gains opportunity. Uh, that there's mutual gains to be had for the employer as well to engage with unions and to have a workplace where employees feel that they have influence and where they have a good remote working policy. Uh, because of course, employee retention is a big issue for employers now. So why wouldn't you want to have a workplace which meets their preferences? Yeah, and um, the last, you, you mentioned at the, the beginning, the last research that we did together um, gave rise to the Right to Disconnect um, campaign and we successfully secured a code of practice, but that code of practice isn't legally binding and there's no mechanism to sort of prosecute a case for a breach of the code itself. Mm. So I know there's other mechanisms through the organisation working on that, but an actual breach of the code itself, you can't prosecute, um, prosecute legally. And, and obviously this survey that we've done more recently, again highlights, I think you, you described it as, as the draining impact of kind of working from home and some of the long hours that are um, associated with that. So could the um, could a practice uh, on the right to disconnect be improved? What should we, we be asking the government to do to make that stronger for, for workers? Yeah, the code of practice, as it currently stands, needs to be put on a stronger statutory footing. Um, as you mentioned, uh, there's no legal right of any worker to take um, a complaint or action against an employer if the code of practice is not followed. Um, so that's, you know, a, a weakness of the legislation. Uh, and we know from research um, nationally that there are a significant proportion of businesses which don't have a right to disconnect policy, even though they should do. So it means that the code of practice is not a strong enough incentive for people, for employers to introduce a, a, a right to disconnect policy. So it needs to be much stronger. And we see from what people have said in our research um, that the company culture is extremely important. The role of the manager is extremely important. And we see that a significant proportion of people are regularly working more hours than what's in their contract. And the code of practice specifically says that people should not be regularly, regularly working more hours uh, than what's in their contract. So there is a, a gap here between what the code of practice is intending to do and the reality of what people are experiencing in the workplace. Okay, and um, have you any further research um, coming out with FSU uh, in the future and what does it focus on? Yes, the next report we're doing for uh, the FSU is on technological surveillance. Uh, there were some indications from the first report we did in 2019 that people felt that their work was being monitored quite extensively uh, through technology, and we've delved into this uh, even further. Um, and the general feedback we're getting from respondents is that people feel that when you have a lot of technological surveillance by employers, when people feel that they're being monitored extensively, 
effectively uh, through technology by employers, that they feel that this is indicative of a mistrustful employment relationship, that employers must distrust their employees um, in order to have so much monitoring, uh, and that this is damaging for the employment relationship overall. Uh, there's also questions about, well, what are employers doing with the data, and what is the level of surveillance? Because many employees are not sure of how much surveillance uh, is being undertaken and a lack of clarity about, about that is something that uh, needs to be investigated further. Okay, Dr. Michelle O'Sullivan, thank you very much for um, participating today. Um, we've heard key issues around um, the costs associated with working from home and also the desire uh, from a lot of our members and workers in the sector to have working from home um, as part of their future work. So FSU will develop this as part of our industrial strategy. Um, we've also once again heard the need for union recognition and collective bargaining legislation to, so that workers and employees can independently negotiate and bargain uh, flexible working arrangements and remote uh, working policies um, with their um, employers. So thank you again, um, Michelle, and all of your colleagues in UL. We look forward to the upcoming research as well on employee surveillance. And if you are not a member of FSU or you're not a member of a trade union, I once again encourage everyone listening to join their union so that together we can make work better for you and for your colleagues. Thanks very much.